Yeah, so thanks everyone for coming today. Um, very happy to have Omar Angel from UBC. Um, who will tell us the tale of two balloons. Uh, yes, so uh, this is a project with uh, Goa Bray and Dinon Spika, and we also had some discussions with Thomas Budzinski in early stages, but in the end, he's not a co author. And and at least the Israeli contingent in the audience will recognize the title, which is uh, which is which alludes to an Israeli children's book, A Tale of Five Balloons, uh, in which there are uh, five balloons, uh, but they all pop. And this the fact that every balloon eventually pops at the end is indeed a, a big part of the story that I will tell you. So, uh, so we are considering the following process. Uh, I'll start with just defining the process and then say a bit about the relations, but the process itself is actually very easy to define. So, uh, so you start with some point process in some metric space. So uh, start with, uh, let's call it pi. So this is some point process in some space XD, which is assumed to be a metric space. And, and we don't need too many assumptions for the process to be defined, but eventually we will look mainly at uh, very specific spaces. And so uh, we start growing balloons around the point. So we have some points and and we grow uh, balls at rate one from each point. So you start having balls and at time t, the balls have radius t. So maybe it's some small time you do this and then at some later time you get this. And inevitably two of the balloons will at some point touch each other. And the rule is that if two balloons touch, Uh, then they pop and annihilate. So, uh, so here we have these two balloons that touch, so we just delete them. And the process keeps running, so you, so you keep growing the balloons, and and maybe you have uh, those two that touch and annihilate, and so on and so forth. So, so the process. Uh, just have uh, so at each time you just have some configuration of uh, the still existing balloons at time t. So uh, is the process itself uh, completely clear? Uh, I should ask, and if anything, if there are any questions or anything is unclear, then please do interrupt me. Um, yes, it does appear double. So, uh, so there are lots of things that you can ask about this. And I should mention this is motivated, uh, at least uh, for Mitai Benjamini, it's motivated by questions about coalescing and annihilating random walks. So there is a result that if you take uh, any reasonable graph and you start a particle at every site and these particles perform either coalescing or annihilating random walks. So again, when two particles touch, in one case, they annihilate. In the other case, they coalesce and keep moving together. And uh, there are results that this process is uh, recurrent under mild assumptions on the graph. So that's uh, a loose motivation. And the question is, uh, is this process recurrent or transient? So do the balloons keep uh, returning? So one of the first things that you can do is run a simulation. Though actually, uh, in this case, this is one of the last things that we do. So, so the most recent file in the directory is the following animation that I will show you. So uh, um, let's see. So I want uh, balloons four, and let's start from the beginning. Uh, is this visible now? 
Yeah. So, uh, if, so what you see here very faintly is the blue dots for the balloons. And as we start going the process, you see that, uh, and now it falls, you see that, uh, that a lot, many of the balloons have already popped. So the gray ones are ones that have already touched and popped. And the blue ones are the ones that are still active. So at some small time, you get this. Uh, I should mention there is a big surprise at the end of this movie. So uh, it's not at all what you'd expect. So the balloons keep uh, growing and popping and and okay, and if uh, if you just uh, keep going, letting this process go indefinitely, then eventually the balloons will be too big to to be visible. So what we do in this animation, actually, at some point uh, we just switch, and uh, well, we no longer draw the dead balloons, but we start zooming out. So we zoom out so that the balloons will keep having a uniform apparent uh, radius. But since we are zooming out, then the, bulls, the balloons seem to be moving towards the origin. And again, they keep popping as, they, as two balloons touch. So this is what the process looks like. Um, and this is the surprise. Uh, any questions about this process? Or... So, so here's the, the first question uh, that I was asked. So is this process recurrent or transient in the following sense? So is a given point contained inside the balloons, inside the balloon infinitely often or not? So I see, and this is what I said might happen. So I don't know how many of you are using uh, Apple pencils with iPads, but what do you do if uh, it starts to stutter like this and uh, only writes half of what you're writing? Does anyone have experience with this? So this should be a, a completely continuous queue, for low? example. What's that? Maybe the battery is low. Uh, I don't think so. It's 96%. Uh, so is any point uh, contained in a balloon infinitely often, or is it transient? So transient means that eventually the balloons are far away from the origin. And we can prove the following the following theorems and so uh, we mainly focused on uh, what happens if you start with the Poisson process so if pi is a Poisson process in rd then it's recurrent On the other hand, if pi is a Poisson process in the hyperbolic space, in the hyperbolic plane H, it is transient. So transient, uh, so that uh, every point is eventually not contained in any balloon. And indeed, you can also uh, consider an animation in hyperbolic space, which looks like that. So you have the hyperbolic plane and you have the point process, which, and these balloons all have the same radius in the hyperbolic space. And again, you see the points, the balloons are growing. And there's two of them touch, uh, these two will annihilate. And you can see that uh, the balls are sort of uh, quite far away at this point from the origin. And occasionally you do get some balls that grow and get significantly closer to the origin, but they don't quite make it. So uh, they always seem to pop before coming to the origin, before getting all the way to the origin. And uh, it's not completely clear from the simulation that this is indeed what happens or whether 
later on there will still be some some balloons that will somehow make it to the origin but from the theorem it turns out that this is not the case so this is uh so these are the two uh the two main uh, theorems that I want to talk about, but uh, there's quite a lot of uh, quite a lot more that uh, is said about this along the way. So it turns out uh, that you can ask uh, how close do balloons get to the origin if they if it's not recurrent. So in the hyperbolic plane, we can even define we can even get something more detailed about this so so in a, so a, so we can define the following let rt is the distance to the nearest balloon at time t so this is the distance uh, okay so let me just say so a notation so pi t is the set of points that are still active at time t so active centers at time t using the canadian spelling of centers and uh, and rt not p but r so this is the distance between zero and pi t so i'm uh, i'm uh, not there uh, yeah i'm confusing pi t with its uh, support but shouldn't be any confusion there so uh, there's this distance, uh, and it turns out so. So we have the following more detailed results. So in the Euclidean plane R D, we have that uh, the lim inf of R T over T is equal to zero. So if R T over if R T is smaller than T, so at time T the balloons have reduced T. So if R T is less than T, then it means that the balloon covers a point. So if RT is much smaller than T, it means that not only is zero contained in a balloon, but zero is actually relatively close to the center of the balloon. And on the other end, in the hyperbolic plane, we have a different result. We have that the lim inf of RT over T is almost truly at least 1.44, the precise quantity we get is log t over log of one plus root five over two, which is greater than one. And the consequence of this is that not only is the origin eventually not contained in any of the balloons, but it tells you that in the, for example, in the Poincaré disk model, it tells you that uh, the balloons do not get uh, within a certain distance from the origin in this picture. So it tells you that uh, they go uh, very close to the boundary asymptotically. So, uh, so I will also talk about about other spaces a bit later, but but let me uh, tell you uh, about some of the related background, which has to do with stable matchings. So, so a quick poll, uh, how many people here are familiar with the notion of stable matchings? If you can say something like yes, no. Uh, and, uh, um, just Q, just, uh, I'm going to say what they are in, a, in any case, but just curious how many people are familiar with, the, with this. Okay, so we get uh, uh, two semi-positive results, two semi-negative results, and lots of people who have probably went to get breakfast or lunch or something. So, uh, so what's a stable matching? So the so this goes back to uh, to I think the sixties. And the idea is that you have some set, uh, so, so in the classical uh, picture, you have some set of men and some set of women. And each of the, every man has some preference 
on the women, some uh, ranking of uh, which women uh, he finds more desirable and less. And every woman has some ranking on the men, uh, which men are more desirable or not. And you want to have some matching. So, uh, and uh, a matching is stable. It means that if, uh, or let's say, uh, it's easier to say what it means for it to be unstable. It's unstable if there are pairs, uh, there exist pairs x, y, and x prime, y prime, such that according to x, y prime is preferable to y. So this means that uh, according to the preference of x, y prime is prefer preferred to y. And according to y prime, x is preferable to x prime. So that means that if you have, so if you have here x and here y, and here you have maybe x prime, and let's make this x prime and this is y prime. So that means that you have the pair, the, the pair x and y prime, which uh, makes this unstable because x and y prime will just uh, go with each other. They prefer each other over the current partner. And uh, it doesn't matter if X prime and Y would be unhappy about this. So maybe X prime and Y would, would also be happy with the switch, but even if they are not, this is unstable. And the classical theorem due to Gale and Shetley is that, uh, so, so there exists a stable matching So for any set of preference orders, stable matchings always exist between, uh, uh, between every, uh, between the men and the women. And in our situation, this is a more modern situation. So we don't have the men and the women. We can just consider a single population So you have a single population like so, and you can consider the preference is just by distance. So you consider the, okay, so, so it's just ranked by distance. So every point has a preference order uh, on the other points. It uh, prefers to be matched to, to the points uh, that are as near as possible to it. And again, you are we are looking for stable matchings of the points. And so uh, you can consider maybe a matching like this. Uh, and, and again, you can ask uh, for it to be stable in the sense that there is no pair that makes it unstable. There's no, in the, with the exact same definition as before, except that previously we said X and men, there's no population. And again, there exists a stable matching. And in this case, it's even unique. So in this case, the stable matching is unique. Now this stable matching uh, was studied among other things in a paper of Holroyd, Pimantel, Perez and Schramm. So they studied several notions of matchings on Poisson processes, including the stable one. And okay, so the uniqueness uh, is uh, predates this paper, but uh, but uh, this is a good reference for matchings of the Poisson process. So in this case, uh, there exists a unique stable matching. And one of the things that, the, so they have several results about this, including about the stable matching. They study the, the law of the, day, of the distance to the, to the matching. So one of the big questions here, if you have a typical point, what is the distance to its match? So every point is going to be, to end up being matched. And, and what is the distance to its matching? And 
It turns out that uh, the tail of this is approximately known, but not exactly. And this is closely related to the balloon process because we have the following procedure for finding the matching. So you just look for a pair of points that are pair mutually the nearest to each other, and you match them. And you can see that in any stable matching, if X is the closest to Y and Y is the closest to X, then they must be matched in any stable matching. Otherwise, they would be an unstable pair. So you just, uh, so you just find it by uh, iteratively pair mutually nearest points. So you take two, a pair of points that are mutually closest, you pair them and uh, just eliminate them from consideration. And you see that this is exactly what the balloon process is doing. The balloon process, you start growing these balloons and when two of them touch, well, if two balloons touch uh, before touching anything else, it exactly means that the two balloons are mutually the closest to each other. And, uh, and so you match them and then you no longer consider them in the process. So, uh, okay, so this is uh, closely related. Says, and the question of the recurrence and transients, this distance RT to the set of active points. So this is exactly a question which uh, is, which is uh, certainly comes up uh, from that paper, from the whole detail paper. A question about what, the, what does the set of uh, points that have distance larger than T, what does this set look like? So you get some point process in the plane and for pi t, so pi t is a, is a set of, is a point process and we know that it has separation at least to t. So uh, is a set uh, with a minimal distance at least to t between any two pair of points since if, if there were nearby points they would have touched and popped. So this is a set that is well separated and as a consequence, it must have the density is the density of pi t is at most one over the volume of a ball of radius t. So in the Euclidean space, this is t to the d and in the hyperbolic space, it's exponential. So uh, what we get is that uh, the the fractures, so the density uh, is, uh, so this is at most constant over t to the d in Rd. And it's not known if this is the correct behavior. It's conjectured. So the density of pi t is asymptotically some constant over t to the d in Rd. So this is just a conjecture. So uh, the, the whole of the paper has a somewhat uh, weaker result. They give that a certain uh, moment of, uh, of the distance is infinite, which, uh, which shows that the tail uh, cannot be any smaller power, but it does leave some gap there, uh, potential gap for a, uh, uh, for say log corrections, which we cannot rule out. And it's very natural to believe, especially looking at the simulation that we've seen before, it's very natural to believe this. So if you look at this uh, model of the simulation where I start zooming out, it appears that there's some kind of a stationary picture. So it appears that uh, when you keep zooming out and you, you see balloons coming in from the outside, the whole process appears to be stationary and indeed uh, there's a st an even stronger conjecture will be that if you look at uh, pi t and rescale it by a, you scale by a scale space by a factor of t, that this converges in distribution to some point process uh, in space, which would be stationary under a certain dynamics. And again, this is something that uh, we are not able to do yet, though I should mention that uh, Ander Holroyd has some uh, un 
some unfinished paper with Tom Liggett and a former student uh, where they can analyze this in one dimension. So even in one dimension, the problem, uh, this problem is not at all obvious, but in one dimension, it turns out that this can be done. So, uh, so this are, uh, so this is a bit of the picture, a bit of the background, and I want to uh, to move a bit towards some of the proofs and some of the ideas in the proofs. But if there are any questions, this would be a good time. Um, okay, so, uh, so uh, Omer, so yes, it's yes. it's definitely not the case that Poisson is invariant, though. This is well, po easy. yeah. So Poisson is not invariant because this process necessarily has uh, this uh, separation uh, of two t. So the point process that you get here is a point is a point process where you can't have two points a distance less than two. So okay, right. So initially. So it's not, if you thin a Poisson point process by that condition, then you know, then that's what you well, do so, right? So how exactly do you do the thinning, right? So but when you start out with the oh I see. So you start with the Poisson points and then yeah, you let so, them expand from zero. I see. Yeah. yeah, if you just if you just let the process run up to time one, so at time one you have balls of radius one. Uh, so no, I don't believe that this is a stationary measure. I don't immediately see a, a reason why it cannot be a stationary measure. Uh, so I should mention the Gura, one of my co-authors who is in the audience, uh, maybe. Is it ergodic? Maybe you see either? some reason. Uh, well, you know? this process would have to be ergodic, but uh, and certainly the if you certainly if you truncate this at some finite time, it's ergo, you get something ergodic, but. But we know that there's there's only one invariant measure for these processes. Uh, I we don't, and uh, we don't know that there's uniqueness, and there are some gen, some degenerate things. So if you start, so if you start with point process only on a line, then you also keep seeing this at any time. So so you need to uh, ask for strong enough. Uh, so you want it to be strongly ergodic. Uh, at the very least, and you want or just uh, or just require symmetries to all of the isometries of the plane. Um, in addition, so yeah, so it's not uh, so it's not quite clear. Uh, so uh, okay, so I, let me yes. I I would expect things to be more correlated than than the Poisson, but I don't have an immediate argument. Are yeah, I should mention that monotonicity, you know, the, in the language you're interacting particle systems, you know, do you have monotonicities attracted? You know, uh, no, there's no, there's no monotonicity. And, and in one dimension, uh, it's uh, the, what you're saying is not, uh, does not hold. In one dimension, the, at any finite time, you get something different from the limit. And the reason you can analyze this in one dimension is that in one dimension, you have a renewal process. At any finite time, you have a renewal process, uh, which is, again, it's, uh, it requires some uh, observations to justify, but, but, but then you can uh, sort of figure out what is the distribution of the, of the gaps at time t. And it, is, it does depend on t. Um, okay, so uh, so to uh, to prove this uh, result, say uh, in the Euclidean case. Uh, uh, so, by the way, what time uh, should I plan to finish? One twenty-five or one thirty or so. Okay. Yeah, for your ten. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, twenty-five is good. So. Uh, so for the Euclidean case, uh, well, a lot of the proof is, uh, well, a, a, a big part of the proof is actually in the Holroyd paper et al. Uh, and this, uh, 
So uh, the holoid Pimentel Perez and Schramm paper, they they actually they actually prove that in RD we have that the So what they show is that there exist infinitely many balloons that come halfway to the origin. So almost surely there exists infinitely many balloons that reach uh, halfway to the origin. So what does it mean? Let's say that X so X uh, U, so this is the death time of a point U. So if you have U one of the points in the point process and X U is the time at which it dies, then this means that uh, the limb soup of X U over the norm of U, no absolute value needed is at least a half. And the reason for this, uh, this comes, uh, this doesn't re rely fully on the Poisson process. This uh, does use insertion and deletion tolerance. And uh, in just in one minute, the idea is that every point is eventually matched in this process. You can't have unmatched points, but then you can say, well, what happens if you put another point at the origin? If you add another point near the origin because of insertion tolerance of the Poisson process, this point would have to get matched. So this means that there would be some balloons that will reach uh, halfway to that point, uh, which is necessary for to be matched with them. And uh, the reason there have to be infinitely many is that if you remove some of those balloons that would be matched with a, with a new extra points, then some other point would be matched to it. So the, you use also deletion tolerance of the Poisson process. So this is a very quick, uh, statement of roughly where this comes from, but, but this mainly relies on uh, insertion plus deletion tolerance of the Poisson point process. So if you add or delete points, uh, you get something absolutely continuous, uh, plus the fact that everything is eventually matched, so every balloon eventually explodes, and, and ergodicity. So uh, you get that the limb soup of X U over U is at least a half. And, and so uh, what I claim is that actually the limb soup is infinite, the limb soup over U. So, so the claim is that the limb soup is infinite and this exactly means, so if X U is much larger than U, this means that the balloon starting from U expands uh, well beyond the origin and uh, that gives the RT over T in the result. Now, uh, I should mention this is also, this is, yeah, so uh, this is not just in RD, this is true in any, so, so this is true also in the hyperbolic space, but in the hyperbolic space, we do not uh, deduce that, uh, so this is also in the hyperbolic space, but we have the theorem that in Rd, the limb soup of uh, x u over u is equal to infinity, which is equivalent to Rt over t uh, going as a limb in zero, because as we said, we have, we have some points uh, which uh, have a balloon that, that is much larger than the distance to the origin. And this relies on a, on a theorem uh, that that seems to be uh, very classical. And when, uh, when we uh, first wrote it down, I said, well, this surely must be known. And we asked some people, we asked uh, not many people actually, uh, we said, well, the, this must be well known. And indeed one of the first people that we asked, Dr. Zaituni uh, came back almost immediately with the reference to a paper uh, in the seventies of uh, David Tani, which uh, proves exactly this result. Except that uh, Tani's argument uh, is only for one dimension and uh, doesn't seem to extend. And, uh, and uh, so we have a, a new and simpler proof, which also works in any dimension. So, and it's, uh, but if any of you have seen this before, then, uh, then please uh, uh, tell us the reference. So this is the theorem. So, so if X uh, U uh, is ergodic, 
is a summer ergodic process in uh, ZD, or you can do this also uh, in, uh, in real space, it doesn't, uh, you can trivially convert between one and the other. So, but, uh, so you have some ergodic process indexed on ZD. Then the limb soup of uh, XU over norm of U is either zero or infinity almost surely. Um, so uh, I think, uh, so I'm sure you'll agree this uh, appears like something very classical that uh, that must have been known uh, for ages. So Tannis proof uh, from the 70s rely on, relies on relating a certain, relating uh, this to a certain mark of, to a certain branching process which is not time homogeneous. Uh, it has some uh, random, some random environment uh, telling, controlling the branching over time and relating it to survival or extinction of this process, and uh, relies uh, relies also on some results in in the thesis. But uh, but uh, but it turns out that this is true in any dimension, and uh, the proof. Uh, the proof is actually uh, very nice, um, but uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, let me let's spend a couple of minutes just uh, showing you the proof for this, and then uh, and then this uh, will finish the argument in the Euclid hyperbolic in the Euclidean case. We can talk a bit about hyperbolic settings in the remaining time. So here's the proof. So. And I will draw some pictures for the proof. So, so this uh, the, I'll draw a one-dimensional uh, picture. So we have uh, so we have Zs and we have this process xt. So we have uh, so we have some process at every point. You have some uh, some value xt at every a, at every n. You have xn. Now, what does it mean that uh, the limb soup of, uh, of Xn over N is at least some A? So limb soup of Xn over N uh, is at least A means that you have, so suppose you're standing here at zero. So it means that if you look at slope A, that you almost surely see infinitely many points that are above this slope. So you have infinitely many, if you think of those as trees, so you almost surely have trees that are uh, where the height of the tree is at least A times the distance to the tree. So instead of this, let's uh, consider these cones. So you can put, uh, let's co consider cones with slope A. So you can consider these such cones and So this exactly means that, uh, so the basis uh, of uh, cones of slope A cover everything almost truly. So I must suppose, I'm assuming that, uh, I'm assuming that we have this uh, limb soup at least A, then the cones cover the cover everything almost truly. So what are these, what are the basis of these cones? So the basis of the cones, uh, so now we're switching to a two to a two dimensional picture. So the basis of these cones are some circles because every point around every point I get a circle and they get some uh, collection of circles like this that covers everything. And now you can use the Vitali covering lemma. So, uh, The Vitali covering lemma says that you can select a subset of uh, these balls, uh, which are pairwise disjoint, so that there, uh, so that if you rescale them by a factor of three, then they cover, they still cover everything. So I can select some uh, collection of balls, maybe uh, maybe these ones. So uh, there exists a disjoint subset. 
such that uh, there uh, three times blow up also covers all of ZD. So this is just a deterministic statement about point processes, about, uh, about sets of balloons in metric spaces. And because of that, we get that, uh, now because of that, uh, we get uh, something about the, the, the density. So we get that, uh, we get that uh, the density of these points is large. Um, okay, sorry, I, yeah, so yeah, my headset needs to be recharged, but probably it will last the rest of the talk. So, so what this tells us is that we have a disjoint collection of points, but now because they are disjoint collection, because we have a disjoint collection of points, uh, we deduce from this that uh, we deduce from this the, the, the density of these disjoint sets. Uh, so because they are disjoint, uh, the density of the these yellow balls is they cover at most once. So the so these yellow balls, these yellow balls cover without blow up at most uh, have a density at most one because they are disjoint. So that means that on average, every point, so on average, a point is covered at most some constant number of times in the original process, in the blow up. Because uh, when you increase the ball by a factor of three, you increase the volume by at most uh, three to the D. And now what does this blow up increase? This blow up exactly tells you that, uh, so this blow up is exactly asking about uh, points where you get a different slope. So the final result of this, if you uh, put all of this together, you get that, uh, you get that if you have, so if you look at some other slope, you have the slope A, if you look at some, if you look at some, uh, some other slope uh, B, then you can relate you can relate the probability that a point uh, is covered uh, by some cone with slope B to the probability that it's covered by a point in cone, by a, co by a cone of slope A. And, uh, and you deduce the, so, okay, so there's a, a couple of steps of reasoning, which I will not write out, but the corollary of this, the consequence. So the conclusion is that, uh, that uh, the probability that uh, you are covered by some slope uh, B is positive. Uh, covered uh, by some slope B for, uh, for arbitrary slopes B. And from this you deduce that if, if you are almost truly covered by slope A, then you are covered by any slope and therefore the limb soup must be infinite. That's, uh, that's basically the idea of this proof. So, okay, so uh, this was a bit quick. I, I know, but I want to say a few things about uh, the hyperbolic case because uh, there are some very different ideas that come into this. And, but if there are any questions before I do that, Ergodicity is used, uh, well, I want to argue that uh, it's almost truly, uh, the, 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 the limb soup of x u over u is an almost true constant. Yeah, you don't need ergodicity actually. So, uh, yeah, so, okay. So the way I wrote this state, the theorem, you don't need ergodicity. With ergodicity, you can say that it's either almost truly infinite, zero or almost truly infinity. But yeah, you, you, this doesn't actually, uh, decided so as written uh, it's enough even to to say here uh, translation invariant that's right uh, yeah so for for the in the ergodic case it's either almost truly zero or almost truly infinity the point is that you cannot have any other value for the limb soup uh, thank you Amir so uh, 
Okay, so, uh, so in order to do the hyperbolic space, actually what we need uh, is to look at uh, trees first. And let's consider the process on trees. So, so TD, so this is the D regular tree. So every vertex has a degree three. And you can also consider similar processes on the tree where you have points. Now, if the vertices start at the, if the, if the point process starts on the vertices, then the points will touch at the integer or half integer times and you have ties and you don't want to break this. But you can say that the points uh, live somewhere on the, on the edges at a random location. So you can make this into a continuous space where uh, you can say that the points, uh, that the points live uh, somewhere on the edges, not you can have multiple ones on the same edge and some edges are empty. And again, you can start going balls. You think of it as a continuous metric space and you can apply exactly the same thing. And, and the first, uh, and the main step is to, uh, for the hyperbolic case is to understand this process on trees. Now on the tree, let's consider Let's consider all this, the set, uh, let's consider the set that is active at time t. So the active set at time t is uh, some set. Uh, so let's say it's, you have this one and maybe you have something here. Uh, so this is again, it's a well separated set on the tree. And you can, uh, you can round everyone to the nearest vertex. So this gives us a random subset of vertices. So this gives a set of vertices in uh, the D regular tree, which is a uh, 2T separated. So you cannot have two points that are closer than 2T to each other. And it's also a factor of IID. Now, uh, given time, I will not uh, go into a precise definition. I hope many of you are familiar with this, but uh, roughly this means that uh, you have this, uh, this, uh, this independent noise everywhere for every edge you say, what are the initial points? And uh, the set of points that you have here is determined by the is determined as a measurable function of that uh, factor, of the, as a measurable function uh, with, of this uh, independent noise. And we have the following uh, result. So uh, such a set has density at most. So, a, so we have a set that is 2T separated uh, so it has to be 2T separated and also a factor of IID. It must have a density, which is at most some uh, constant times T times uh, D minus one to the minus two T. Now you should compare this the volume of a ball is uh, D minus one to the T. And if you have a set that is 2T separated, the balls are disjoint. So the trivial bound is on the order of D minus one to the minus T, just because uh, you have disjoint balls. So basically it's uh, the density is comparable to the volume of balls of size uh, twice uh, the radius that, uh, that needs to be disjoint. And this relies on the fact that it's a factor of IID. If you don't require it to be a factor, then you can find the uh, points that are, uh, you can find sets that are denser. And this relates to uh, earlier works uh, of, of Bolobash uh, who uh, looked at independent sets uh, in the tree. And it uh, relates to a uh, work of, uh, of uh, Virag and uh, Rahman about uh, local algorithms for independent sets. So exactly uh, a similar kind of relation. And the idea for this And again, uh, I'm going to be fairly vague in the last few minutes uh, and just give some ideas of uh, how things are done. So the idea is that we can approximate uh, the tree by a finite graph. 
for a finite configuration model. So you take uh, some finite number of vertices, every vertex has uh, the edges and you connect them randomly. You use random connection. So locally this looks like a tree. Now on this configuration model, you can just use a union bound for any large set, the probability that a particular large set is going to be uh, well separated is extremely small. And uh, there's a birthday effect here. So once you cover, once the ball covers the square root of the volume, it becomes unlikely. That's why you get this uh, square, this tutti here. So, uh, so here you just use a union bound. There's a no large, uh, well separated set. in this configuration model. But then if you have a factor of IID on the tree, then you can approximate this factor by a block factor by something that only looks up to a finite radius. And then you can, uh, and then you'd be, if you have something with a high density on the tree, then you'd be able to also find something with a high density in the finite graph, uh, which would be a contradiction. So that's a, uh, so, uh, so uh, for T equals one, this was done by Bolovash. Uh, I, I don't, but, uh, for larger t, this, uh, this is new, but uh, the ideas are, um, are basically the same ideas. So that's uh, what happens on the tree. And the consequence of this is that on the tree, so the so a corollary is that the balloon process uh, on the deregular tree has a limb soup of uh, RT over T is at least two. And this becomes just a union bound. You ask what's the probability that you have an active point at time T close to, close to the origin and just take a union bound. So on the tree, you get this uh, limb soup uh, is at least T. Now uh, for the hyperbolic space, so if you have the Poincare disk, well, we can uh, up, we can uh, embed a tree inside it. We can uh, so we can triangulate it uh, in this way. So we have this canonical triangulation of the disk, and you have the dual tree, which uh, and if you have a process on the. If, and if you have the process in the space, you can project it to a process on the tree. So you can say every point that is active at time t. So if we have some point at time t that is still active, say somewhere here, then I just uh, map it to the corresponding center of the point. And if I have a point that is active here, I map it to this vertex. And at time t, you cannot have, uh, you have the, the set of active points in the hyperbolic plane are going to be uh, well separated. So this implies that also the set of, uh, of uh, when you round them to the centers of the triangles, they're also well separated. And consequently, we get some well separated set on the tree. We lose some constant here. So this uh, log two over log one plus square root five, this comes from, from the comparison of distances on the tree to distances on the hyperbolic uh, in the hyperbolic space. So that's why we lose some constant. And the conjecture is that uh, that this is the limb soup also in the hyperbolic plane. But, but this proof is uh, inherently losing at this point. Um, okay, so I think this is a good time and place to stop. So, uh, so thank you. Have questions? You can unmute yourself and ask. In the in the hyperbolic plane, maybe it's a very stupid question, but um, the density of your initial point process um, may give different processes a priori. No, that's true. Yes. So in the Euclidean plane, you have scale invariance, so you expect the same behavior in the hyperbolic plane. Uh, it's conceivable, but uh, this doesn't actually say, require much about the initial density and about the, the initial point process. So, so the proof is fairly robust in that uh, 
So we need some kind of insertion and deletion tolerance for, uh, for the initial process of points, but you don't even have to need to have a constant density. You can even have some density that varies in some complex way and it would still go through. Um, I can, but yes, so uh, certainly uh, the, we get the exact same bounds for any initial density in the hyperbolic plane. Good. Thanks. I can... Could you could your methods deal with a process where the points have different growth rates of the bubbles, or maybe the rates are sort of randomly changing in time, or is, is the yeah, so connection uh, to this matching too strict for that? So yeah, so this is indeed uh, one of the questions that. Uh, that we still uh, cannot uh, resolve uh, exactly. So uh, what happens if the points have uh, different growth rates? Uh, so, so you still have a well-defined, so there still is a corresponding matching setting and uh, there's a well-defined unique matching, but, and some parts of the argument uh, seem to go through, but certainly, uh, certainly not everything. And, and uh, and yeah, and that, that's certainly an interesting problem. Uh, and so, so in particular, the the final result of recurrence in ZD we we do not have at this point. But it's, but it's a natural question. And uh, maybe a, a special case of this is when the growth rates are either one or zero. So you just have some points that. Uh, some balloons where uh, the pump is uh, broken and they just uh, stay at size zero until someone touches them. That would be maybe the simplest uh, setting, but. Um, and if the rates were, you know, maybe they grow like uh, some kind of subordinator or something, so they're not constant, is that maybe much harder? Or? Uh, yeah, so. Uh, so you can more generally, you can consider, so the more general setting, you can consider some uh, sets. So you have uh, at each uh, U, you have some set, uh, some set uh, process uh, S U of T, which initially is the point U, but it grows and it doesn't necessarily have to grow. So uh, it could also just move around. So you can have S U to be just uh, a simple uh, ball of a fixed radius that just moves around, or you can have uh, something like the, something like a uh, Wiener sausage, just the trace of Brownian motion. Uh, so uh, there are many possible uh, generalizations here. And yeah, and, uh, and some of these generalizations uh, get back closer to this motivation of, and of looking at coalescing random walks, coalescing or annihilating random walks. Uh, some of them are closer to this to this symmetric one. But yes, so there are many generalizations and, and there, there are many open problems here that our methods do not, do not resolve yet. So uh, since, uh, since uh, several, uh, yes. It looks like your, uh, the dichotomy between uh, the hyperbolic uh, space and RD has to do with the volume growth. Uh, Indeed. Do you expect to have a more general uh, theory or a more general conjecture about uh, the change from uh, recurrence to trans? Because the method seems to rely on, on nice symmetries of this specific example. Yes, so, so, so RD is, so the proof in RD is not completely uh, restricted to RD. So if you do this on some other uh, on some other group with polynomial growth, then uh, it more or less goes through without any change. So you need the, so I should mention there is one uh, sticky point that you need insertion and deletion tolerance for the point process. So if you take the points, so if the set of initial points is going to be a perturbation of ZD, so you take a, uh, so you take roughly a lattice, but each point is uh, slightly perturbed, for example, uh, randomly. So this does not have insertion or deletion tolerance. And, and so uh, 
so we can't uh, prove uh, recurrence for this model, even if it's in the two-dimensional case. But the other parts of the argument uh, are not very unique to Euclidean space. So, so the so the polynomial uh, regime is uh, the argument is a bit more robust. So we do have this. Uh, so this argument about the ergodic processes or uh, translation variant processes in the lim soup. Uh, uh, so the proof mainly uses the uh, Vitali covering lemma. So you and you so you need some kind of volume doubling and you need. Uh, uh, so in the Vitali covering lemma is in arbitrary matrix spaces. The second case, the hyperbolic case, uh, the proofs are a bit more uh, lacking, I think. Uh, so for example, for the hyperbolic space, the proof that we have here is uh, relies on saying, well, the tree you can analyze completely and then the hyperbolic, uh, the hyperbolic plane you can approximate in a certain sense by, by a tree. But uh, these kind of approximations are, uh, are very fragile. So even if you look at the three-dimensional hyperbolic space, then, then there's, uh, there's no e equivalently nice uh, approximation of the space by a, by a tree. And certainly uh, for more general hyperbolic spaces, we don't have that. So. Uh, So yeah, so so it does seem uh, like uh, this is roughly uh, like this is roughly the reason you want it to be recurrent or transient. Uh, it seems uh, to, like it would have a lot to do with amenability and non-amenability of the space, but and, but it would be very nice to to have a proof for more general non-amenable spaces. But can you make a conjecture uh, with some confidence that? Uh... It will always be transient in the non-abinable case. Or I believe that, but uh, um, but they wouldn't put it in writing. So, okay. so I see. Thank you. So, uh, but yeah, I, if I had to, if I had to guess, uh, that would be my guess. That in. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there are some questions uh, even in the hyperbolic space. So if you look at, uh, so the proof that we had, uh, so I mentioned, so for the hyperbolic plane, uh, we prove this by connecting it to, to the tree. But can you prove something like this directly? Can you uh, take directly, uh, so can you give a bound? So here's a, so here's a question. So, give a bound on the density of a T separated set, T separated set uh, in H, uh, which is a factor of IID. So the, or oh, let's make it a two T separated as before. So the trivial bound is one over the volume of, uh, of a ball of radius T. And you can somewhat improve this by the comparison to the trees. You get a ball, one over the volume of a ball of some uh, constant times t for some constant 1.4, approximately. But uh, we expect that this should be uh, something like uh, one over the volume of a ball of radius 2t. So, uh, so conjecture, it's at most. Uh, the volume of the ball of radius 2t to the, or let's say, 2 minus epsilon t for any epsilon. Uh, to be slightly careful. So, um, so uh, you can try to approach to repeat the argument uh, using the configuration model. So you can, so, so to try to take some random, uh, some random hyperbolic surface and just try to do some kind of a union bound over that. And uh, so you do have the Weil-Peterson measure for hyperbolic surfaces of genus G. And you can try to work with that. Uh, we, we didn't get there yet, but 
Uh, but uh, but that's a question. Uh, so is the is this uh, is this uh, the case for any vector of ID in the hyperbolic space? Uh, so Tyler asks uh, about finite volume variance concerning the number of balloons. Um, I hadn't thought about the finite volume case. And the expectation would be that uh, you get, uh, that if you look at an exponential time scale, so uh, if you look at this uh, picture where you start zooming out, so in order to do this uh, zoom out, uh, time is moving at an, ex you do an exponential time change. But the expectation would be that, uh, that you get something stationary with this exponential time change. So that uh, up to time t, the number of balls that would visit the origin would be on the order of log t. And this would be another conjecture that, uh, that if you look at an exponential time change, then the origin is covered a constant fraction of time uh, up to time t. And then once you reach a time t when the balloons uh, fill everything, so if you have a finite volume, then you just stop the process. So if you do this, say, on a box of, uh, of size d, of, si of size l, then I would expect it would be log l. Um, but, uh, but we don't have any we don't have any bounds and I'll have to think a bit uh, uh, to see if we can actually deduce anything explicit for finite volumes of, or finite times uh, from what we have. So uh, so uh, the, the key difficulty is that this uh, limb soup of xt over t is at least a half relies on on, ergod on the ergodic theorem. It relies on the fact that if that every point is eventually matched, which is a consequence of the ergodic theorem. So, so this is the this is the least quantitative step in the proof. Any more questions? 